Good evening, everyone. Uh, I see a lot of people are filtering in. Uh, my name is Jeremy Smith. I'm going to officially start the, uh, the session in a few minutes, but I'm going to give about a minute or two of, of radio silence to give all the attendees a chance to, to join in here. Well, good evening, everyone. Um, my name is Jeremy Smith, and I am the Director of the Archives of Appalachia at East Tennessee State University. It is my pleasure to welcome you to tonight's event that we have titled Serpent Handling and Religious Expression, a discussion between Dr. Thomas Burton and Dr. Ron Roach. The motivation behind tonight's event is really twofold. Uh, first, uh, Dr. Burton, is recognized across the globe as one of the world's leading experts in documenting and in studying the customs and the practices of the people of Southern Appalachia. He spent decades conducting groundbreaking ethnographic research in the region, uh, its people, its music, its food traditions, its folklore, its storytelling, and its religious rituals. And he's turned this research into dozens of books and articles that have played a key role in documenting the breadth and the diversity of some of the people who call Appalachia home. He's also given the vast majority of his original research materials to the archives of Appalachia, where a whole new generation of researchers has been able to use his work as the foundation for their own explorations of the region. I'll give Dr. Burton a formal introduction in a moment, but suffice it to say that we at the archives always treasure any opportunity we have to sit with Dr. Burton to draw upon his expansive knowledge. But a second and a more timely motivation for tonight's event uh, is the upcoming premiere of the documentary film titled Alabama Snake. It will premiere on HBO uh, next Wednesday, Wednesday, December the 9th. The film is directed by Theo Love, and it's produced by Brian Storkel. And it explores the story of Glenn Summerford, who was a serpent handling Pentecostal minister who was accused of attempting to murder his wife with a rattlesnake in Alabama in 1991. Dr. Burton researched this story extensively. He published a book about it in 2004 that was titled The Serpent and the Spirit. For the upcoming documentary, the producers drew extensively on Dr. Burton's recorded interviews and other documentation, and they feature Dr. Burton throughout the film. As I say, it premieres next Wednesday on HBO, and in advance of that, we wanted to take advantage of this opportunity to have Dr. Burton discuss his research into that particular event, but also to tell us some about how that one story fits into his broader research into Appalachian religion. Uh, so before I introduce our two panelists, a little bit about the format of tonight's event. Uh, I'll introduce them both and I'll turn it over to them to begin a discussion between the two of them. Once their conversation has ended, 
we'll be leaving some time at the end for them to respond to any questions that you might have. Um, I will be moderating that question and answer session. And the way for you to submit questions is by uh, using a, a Q&A button that you should be able to find on your screen. Uh, on mine, it depends on what kind of a device you're using, but on mine, there's a Q&A button along the bottom. I can click in that button and just type as if I were typing in a, a standard chat box. Uh, only I will be able to see your questions. The other 30 some odd attendees that we have tonight will not be able to see them. Uh, so you won't be sharing your, your questions with, with other attendees. Um, if you would like for me to use your name when I read the question, please include that. Otherwise, I'll be uh, presenting the questions anonymously. <clears throat> uh, we're going to get started in a second, and we're going to plan to wrap up around 8 o'clock Eastern time. So it is uh, my pleasure now to introduce you to tonight's two panelists. Dr. Ronald Roach is the director of the Center for Appalachian Studies and Services and he's the chair of the Department of Appalachian Studies at East Tennessee State University. A native of North Carolina, he comes from a family with deep roots in the mountains and the music of this region. Before he joined ETSU in 2013, Dr. Roach served for 12 years at Young Harris College in Georgia. There he was a professor of communication studies and a vice president for academic affairs. Dr. Roach has an extensive history studying the rhetoric of Appalachia as it appears in the region's literature, its music, and its speech. He's researched the history of early bluegrass festivals, and he's researched the output of a number of Appalachian writers, including Alexander Key and Manly Wade Wellman. And more recently, he's been a key contributor to the field of comparative mountain studies, looking specifically at the cultural and the economic commonalities between the Appalachian Mountains in the US and the Carpathian Mountains in Eastern Europe. Dr. Thomas Burton is a professor emeritus of English at ETSU. He spent his career, as I said earlier, studying the people and the customs of Southern Appalachia. He has turned this research into dozens of books and articles over the years. Uh, he's produced musical studies of the region including his 1981 book on Tom Ashley, Sam McGee, and Booker White, and his 1990 book titled Some Ballad Folk that traces the ballad singing of five Appalachian women. He's written several books and made dozens of presentations on the storyteller Ray Hicks and the Hicks family from North Carolina's Beach Mountain. And he's published books on Southern Appalachian religious practices, including two books on the practice of serpent handling. 1993's Serpent Handling Believers, and the work I previously mentioned, 2004's The Serpent and the Spirit. His most recent book, published just this year, just a few months ago, by the University of Tennessee Press, is titled Voices Worth the Listening, Three Women of Appalachia. And it combines Dr. Burton's expert oral history work with his ongoing concern for the integrity and the respect of the people that he studies and of the value of their personal agency in framing and constructing their own self-presentations to the world. Uh, I would be remiss again not to acknowledge Dr. Burton's longtime support for the Archives of Appalachia, including his foundational work from 1968 to 1972 with ETSU professor Ambrose Manning to create what was known then as the Oral History Archives and what today is a core part of the archives of Appalachia. In addition to that material, he's donated a wealth of additional materials to us. And collectively, his materials are the most used items in the archives of Appalachia. The most used items out of our more than 800 collections of 14,000 books, 90,000 recordings, and almost two miles of research materials. People come here to work with his stuff more than they do anything else. Uh, Dr. Burton and Dr. Roach are both committed to documenting and sharing the stories of Southern Appalachia. And it is my pleasure now to turn this event over to Dr. Roach to begin tonight's discussion. Thank you, Jeremy. And I certainly appreciate all of your work in organizing this event uh, as, as well as your kind introductions. 
Um, and Dr. Burton, I want to thank you, especially for taking your time to talk to us tonight. It is always a pleasure to talk with you. One of, one of the true legends of the ETSU faculty and uh, Appalachian scholarship, and apparently now an emerging star on HBO. So uh, <laughs> thank you, Tom, for being with us. It's always a delight. And I want to thank everyone who has signed in tonight on a snowy, chilly evening here in Northeast Tennessee, uh, although some of you may be in warmer climes. Before we turn our attention to the documentary, I, I want to go further back and talk briefly, Tom, about how you got started studying folklore. And Jeremy has talked a lot about the, the important work you, you've done in, in helping establish the archives of Appalachia. Uh, as well as uh, continuing to help document the uh, traditions and culture uh, history of the region. Appalachian Studies at ETSU owes a lot of ex existence to what you did and your colleagues, Ambrose Manning and Jack Higgs and others uh, in the 1960s, even though Appalachian Studies officially, I suppose, started uh, at ETSU in 1978 with the formation of the Institute for Appalachian Affairs and the Archives of Appalachia. Um, and then of course we became a state center of excellence in 1984. Uh, I would like to mention at this moment that uh, just a couple of weeks ago, we lost Richard Blaustein, who was another one of those key figures in establishing Appalachian studies here at ETSU. And he was our first director of the Institute and then later the center. Um, but we owe so much to to you and your colleagues and all of the, the groundbreaking work you did in those early days. And I thought it would be nice just to hear you briefly talk about how you got started in studying the folklore uh, of the Southern Mountain region. Oh, well, first I'd like to say thank you for all those nice things that Jeremy says. That's very generous of you. I appreciate it. And it's kind of really neat to me that it's, this is, I'm here in the archives of Appalachia, which uh, really has become my home at ETSU. Now, I have been restricted from my home because of COVID somewhat, but I, I kind of regressed from, I was in the English department for a long time and, uh, that's been a very good experience. And then I, I had also an office over in the old library and that, that then was turned into the new library. And now this is the ultra new library with, with the archives in it. And so I've just kind of moved until my home now <laughs> is here in the archives of Appalachia. Um, and it, a really fine report, repository. Um, I'm glad you mentioned Richard Blaustein because <clears throat> when we pre preceded him, Ambrose Manning and I, but um, when Richard came on board at ETSU, he was really the established folklorist. There were several big uh, institutions uh, uh, giving the doctorate in folklore, Berkeley, California, and in Indiana, University of Indiana. And Blaustein was from the University of Indiana. And it was really nice um, that our backgrounds relative to folklore were different, but we integrated really well. There was never any conflict. He never took the super serious, you know, Indiana PhD folklorist, you know, which, which was a really nice thing. Uh, <clears throat> I got started um, really in a way like I got started in all my projects. And that is, with things that seemed really interesting to me. And as I thought about tonight and about stuff that I've done, I didn't have this wide sweeping intellectual philosophical scope that I wanted to achieve 
or to reveal about Appalachia or any of that. I really did things that seemed really interesting to me and I thought were important and important enough to, to find, find out more about it, record it and, and make it available to other people. <clears throat> and in that line, I got started uh, as a junior in undergraduate school. I went to David Lipscomb College in Nashville and we had the uh, benefit of going to Vanderbilt University to take classes that would be uh, then incorporated <clears throat> in our degree. So I decided I would go to Vanderbilt that year and take a class in the English and Scottish popular ballad. It was taught by Donald Davidson, who was one of the original fugitive poets. Uh, I mean, that was just a great, I didn't, I really didn't know how significant he was <laughs> when I took the course, actually. But uh, that introduced me to just a really fine uh, professor that I had then some more work with in my doctorate at Vanderbilt. But <clears throat> he got me really started uh, and my interest in the English and Scottish popular ballad. So <clears throat> when I came to uh, East Tennessee State, it was in 1958 uh, with a one year appointment. <laughs> and I've been here ever since. And <clears throat> when I came, Ambrose Manning was one of my colleagues and he took me kind of under his wing and uh, he had studied folklore at the University of North Carolina and at George Peabody College. He'd done um, uh, an extended master's program there. And he was also involved in the Tennessee Folklore Society and was president at one point. And he got me in, involved in the Tennessee Folklore Society and I kind of went in his footsteps and became president at one point. And so that, that, that was a reinforcement. But then uh, <clears throat> after I got the doctorate um, and close to when I received it, uh, uh, he and I wanted to get out and record some of these people who sang ballads and told stories in, in the area. And actually the very first incident, we were downtown uh, going <clears throat> by uh, Fountain Square and heard this gosh awful, what we thought was noise. <laughs> and all this clanging and chanting and, and we, we couldn't figure out what was going on. And it happened to be a railroad work group. Um, and they were repairing track there uh, at, <clears throat> at Fountain Square, and they were singing in unison in order to move, move the rails. And that led then later into recordings and seeking out some of those uh, what were called Gandhi dancers, and that ultimately led to a film that Jack Schrader and I made. Uh, <clears throat> but there were other things we, I think the first ballad we, we recorded was in Sullivan County. And uh, it, it went on from there with different songs. And we thought we would start a newspaper article singing out. <clears throat> and that, that article allowed us to present to the public some of these materials, some of the song, well, not just ballads, but mainly ballads and folk song, a traditional song. And we would ask them to uh, give us versions of those songs, send them in to us if they had them, or if they had any uh, informants themselves in their families, or if they sang songs. 
and that gave us leads to go to and record. And that really was the initiation of finally getting to know uh, Ray Hicks and his family and all those people of Beach Mountain. Um, so that, oh, go ahead. We are very, very fortunate you, you got interested in that, as you say, and you took that path. And of course that opened the doors to all the research that you've done since. And as Jeremy mentioned, and uh, you know, as we turn our attention to, to tonight's topic, you've written a lot about religion, the practice of religion in Appalachia. And, and rightly so, religion has always played a, a significant role in the region's community. It still does. It's been a hugely uh, positive force in the lives of, of most residents and communities. And we have to remember that Appalachia is, is a large and very diverse area with many different religious groups and denominations and, and, and traditions. Um, the, the, the Appalachian uh, religious scholar Deborah McCauley said that Appalachian mountain religion is made up of a veritable garden of church traditions and, and religious movements. And so that, that's true throughout Appalachia. Here in, in Southern Appalachia, of course, uh, there is much diversity, but the prevalent religious outlook has been Protestant Christianity, uh, generally conservative, uh, very independent in many cases. But like many aspects of Appalachia, religion has been oversimplified and, and too often reduced to stereotypes. So, and, and serpent handling in particular has been used as, as a stereotype uh, about the region and has been sensationalized by the media. So I thought we'd like to hear from you, uh, given your perspective, especially for those who might be listening who are unfamiliar with serpent handling, exactly what this practice is and how widespread it is uh, and, and is it still practiced within the region? Well, <clears throat> you know, I, I think in some ways we do them a disservice and I do this, have done the same thing as to label them serpent handlers. And uh, in my book, uh, the first one I did was serpent handling believers. So I got the believers in there, but still kind of focusing on serpent handlers and uh, they would be better described as uh, holiness um, uh, evangelical Christians fundamentalists who believe in the in the word of God being divinely given and to be interpreted literally and who follow the so-called signs as mentioned in Mark 16 and in other passages as well. The, those, that language of, of, of following the signs and the powers and signs uh, <clears throat> is not restricted to that one particular verse. But really to understand them, they're really an evolution from 200 years of uh, religious practice in the South and one of the, the main streams of religious uh, conviction, starting with the great revival in the 1800s up in uh, Kentucky in Logan County. And uh, the, uh, it, it came about with uh, a preacher named uh, McGrady, uh, and <clears throat> he was a Presbyterian preacher, and he had three little congregations up there, and uh, they were looking for uh, a revival of holiness and spirituality, uh, and uh, they had invited some other preachers to come who were, were two principal ones were McGill brothers and one was a Presbyterian, the other one was a Methodist. And uh, they, they had uh, a sacra, they called sacramental meetings uh, that they would have services from Friday till Sunday and then have the Lord's Supper, the sacrament at the end on Sunday. But during that period, 
uh, uh, all of a sudden, uh, one of the ladies started uh, shouting and crying and, and uh, waving hands. And that kind of <clears throat> even got the preachers involved. The McGills started that same kind of emotional outbreak as, uh, uh, as being interpreted as the spirit of God working on them. And that, that led to uh, these vast uh, revivals uh, that uh, would have thousands of people, uh, not just in those, it started in those congregations at Red River and um, what it was not the, uh, not Pine Ridge, but another- Cane, uh, Cane Ridge. Yeah, Cane Ridge, right and then spread uh, and became really a big thing with thousands of people attending. And then that, that uh, evolving into those camp meetings that would go for, for weeks at a time. And some of them, they would, the whole group would be shouting and, and crying and holding up their arms, maybe falling down to the ground. And, and crying. And <clears throat> what I'm, part of what I'm saying is that these, these individuals that are the sign followers now uh, would not be considered, in, you know, freaks or strange or different. They would, their, their meetings would fall right in to that revivalistic spirit of the 1800s. Uh, then, Developing out of that, then came the emphasis on holiness, and that that grew out of a Methodist doctrine of sanctification. Uh, John Wesley uh, uh, preached about the, the the perfect love of God, and that that perfect love from God and to God then brought about a, a sanctification, a holiness, a separateness. Uh, and that, that uh, for them being sanctified was uh, uh, losing that propensity to voluntarily sin. It didn't mean that they didn't sin, but it was putting away that old man of Adam and putting on uh, the man of Jesus or the man of God and losing that propensity uh, towards a voluntary sin or becoming sanctified. And that, that sense of holiness was not just a spiritual holiness, but it was also uh, manifested in a physical holiness. And that, that is in their dress, in their manner, what they ate, how they appeared, no wearing of gold, and um, what they ate, it was a complete part of their whole being. And it's kind of interesting though. Uh, I was talking to a lady who happened to be a sign follower, Jolo, and she was, of course, holding this and just following Paul. I don't wear any gold or, uh, or uh, jewelry except this watch, which is necessary. <laughs> and that, that always tickled me. Oh, oh, in that case, that's okay. <laughs> but anyway, then this holiness then uh, became very popular and so much so that to the Methodist Pentecostal Church, not, not Pentecostal, Methodist Episcopal, Episcopal Church, they thought it was getting out of hand. So they wanted these holiness uh, persons to, um, to agree to come up under the umbrella of the Methodist Episcopal Church or be separated. So, uh, that I think was 1894 or something, something like that. 
And then that caused a lot of holiness churches being formed throughout the South. Uh, and then these holiness churches then uh, uh, in many cases evolved into Pentecostal churches, holiness Pentecostal uh, churches. And that, that was based upon uh, uh, Acts and a verse in Acts, the second chapter, that <clears throat> on the day of Pentecost, when the apostles came together, they heard a, 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 a mighty rushing wind and noise, and then tongues like as of fire descended on them, and they began to speak in tongues, different tongues, as the Spirit gave them utterance. So this, this was then when how Pentecostalism got started from unholiness. And then some of these holiness Pentecostal groups uh, then look to other uh, signs of, of the spirit and not just speaking in tongues. And that was used as a manifestation of having received the Holy Spirit, but not just the tongues, but the five so-called signs that are mentioned in Mark 16, 17, 18, 19, that before the ascension in that verse, uh, Christ <clears throat> said uh, to go out and preach. <clears throat> and he, the, you know, the believers, they believe they'd be saved, but they didn't, they would be damned. And these signs shall follow the believers. Uh, uh, let's see, uh, speaking, well, speaking with new tongues, um, uh, oh, uh, demons, uh, uh, that's funny, I'm stuttering on it, but, uh, uh, casting out demons, excuse me. And then uh, they shall take up serpents and if they drink any deadly thing, it shall not hurt them. So those are the so-called five signs. And then in that verse, it said, they went forth uh, confirming the word with signs following. So that's the religious evolution of these individuals who are often referred to as sign followers, but they're, they're really Christians who are holiness, Pentecostal, and uh, uh, believe in following these signs. And in many ways, they're like a lot of other churches in the area, um, except for that uh, last bit of the sign following. Mm -hmm. um, <clears throat> how, how widespread would you say that, that the practice has been in the past and today? Well, that's really difficult to say. Um, I've tried to get, a, at one point, try to get all the churches names that I could get because there are two separate main groups of, of sign followers. They're so-called oneness or Jesus only. And then another group that are the so-called Trinity. They believe in baptizing in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. <clears throat> but it's, it's also interesting. Just recently, I was in, uh, uh, in Middlesbrough, and I, well, before that, I was giving a talk on my uh, at a book club on my book on serpentarian believers. Somebody came up to me and gave me a clipping that was done uh, that was from the Knoxville Sentinel before uh, that went out of business. But 
uh, it had serpent handlers on it. So I <clears throat> went to some of my serpent handling friends at Middlesbrough about, you know, what did they know about these? But this was another group that they didn't even know very much about at all, right there in the same place. Oh, they were a church from the Church of the Firstborn. And that was in, back in the, in the 50s. So, but anyway, the point <laughs> is that it's very difficult to get a, a number because they are totally autonomous. Uh, they don't have an over uh, a synod or a convention uh, that uh, they report to or receive license from. So, uh, and also they will, uh, a church will be meeting in maybe someone's house or uh, they will be meeting in an old church, but then uh, for whatever reason, they, somebody moves, preacher moves, or he dies, and that church goes out of existence. And the serpent handlers, too, have a practice of going to these different serpent handling uh, congregations. Uh, so it, it, if, you, if you, in one area, small area, if you had, say, five churches and had, each one had a uh, uh, 20 people in the church, uh, you might think, well, that's five, that's 100 people in that area. But it may not be because 20 of them may be going to all of the churches, you know. So that's a very difficult question. There might, there might be maybe as little as 1,000 churches um, and maybe hundreds of servant handlers themselves. And it, it really, in a big way, got started here in Tennessee. Um, it, it's very difficult to know who was the first one, where did it first get started? But uh, there's no, con they, look, they look back to the first Christian, I mean, the first century with Christ's uh, <clears throat> statement, but there's no continuous thread of serpent handling in Christianity from the first century down to present time. It really gets started in the first part of the 1900s. Um, uh, the, there were there are some oral accounts that it may have started earlier uh, in Kentucky in, uh, in the 1890s or something of that sort. That's by oral tradition. Uh, it, there, there was a man in <clears throat> Alabama uh, uh, that was very significant in, in serpent handling, but very likely um, in a major way, it, it started with a man named George Went Hensley. And that came about uh, sometime between 1908 and say 1913. And <clears throat> at first, well, uh, I won't go into the whole thing, of, uh, but he, he uh, the first written uh, account that I know of was in the Church of God at Cleveland's uh, paper called the Evangel. And it said uh, the, the <clears throat> Uh, the superintendent of the church product in Cleveland said that they had other uh, signs and handling of serpents the previous year. So we know it was going on in 1913. It probably was going on over there in Oodlewall where Hensley got started. He went up into the mountain there, White, White Oak Mountain, at Rainbow Rock, he was concerned about this scripture about handling serpents. He had a serpent who came forward. He picked it up, handled it. Later, he went to the Grasshopper Church of God over near Birchwood, 
from there, he started preaching people, accepting it, uh, getting associated with the Church of God in Cleveland. The Church of God in Cleveland accepted it as a uh, affirmation of the validity of, of what they preached. And these people then went forth from there through mostly the southeastern region. Right. So today, I, I think you're absolutely right. It's hard to get an actual number, but I think most agree that it's a fairly small n a number of, of people who actually practice it. And we should point out that I believe, and correct me if I'm wrong, Dr. Burden, that only West Virginia in every state except West Virginia, there are laws uh, against the practice uh, of using poisonous uh, serpents in worship. Is that correct? Uh, well, not exactly. <laughs> uh, <clears throat> that's often said there are laws except West Virginia. It's true that West Virginia does not, but there are other uh, states in the area that do not have uh, laws restricting serpent handling. And some of those, I think even Georgia or Florida, and I meant to specify that, but uh, or look that up. But they, their law uh, uh, was just left out of the, of the code. It, it's still there, I guess, if somebody wanted to use it, but it's not in the code. So there's been less, really less emphasis on, on the, the uh, criminal code against serpent handling. It started off with codes in Kentucky and it was a felony there. Uh, Tennessee and Virginia came along in 47 and North Carolina and, and uh, Georgia. I think North Carolina it was a felony at first. And if you, were responsible for someone's death, you could be given a death penalty as well. I mean, they were really, and in Kentucky, that law, you couldn't use any kind of reptile in the church. But now it seems that what's used mainly is, uh, are those restrictions about, uh, endangered species of, of serpents and use and crossing state lines with serpents. Mm -hmm. Some of the people like Jeremy in Middlesbrough was arrested for transporting uh, serpents across state line. But usually nothing's done legally until there's a serious incident and then it comes out and which, the law gets involved. Uh, which brings us to the Summerford case. <laughs> yes. Certainly the practice can be quite dangerous. People have uh, have died. And um, this film uh, is about the Summerford case, of course, based on your work. And, and I'm interested in, you know, how you got involved with the Summerford case. And then tell us about your involvement with the film. And, and how did you enjoy that experience? Well, um, I got involved in the case um, because, well, I had, we had made several documentaries of, of serpent handling in religious services. And uh, I had finished that book, uh, Serpent Handling Believers. And uh, I had heard back in 1991, in fact, it was the, the, the vice president of ETSU that says, have you read this article <laughs> about uh, what happened in Scottsboro? <laughs> and uh, so I knew about it in 1991, but I didn't get through with my book and some other stuff with my other research. But uh, <clears throat> I decided then in 1999, I would... Um, go uh, to Scottsboro and, um, and I knew the preacher who took over the church 
from Glenn Summerford after he was in prison. So I got in contact with him and he helped me get in touch with uh, Glenn Summerford's mother and uh, uh, a person, it was kind of an interesting story in a way. There was a person who was over a dance company, Donna Rizzo in Nashville, who wanted to do a, a dance uh, on Serpent Anime. So she wanted to go down. So we went to Scottsboro and met with Glenn Summerford's mother and his, his uh, sister and a woman who was associated with Glenn. And uh, <clears throat> that was really intriguing to begin with because everybody there, the mother and the sister and the other woman said, Glenn Summerford did not, you know, try to murder Darlene, his wife. And he, they said, if you knew Glenn Summerford, you know that he did not attempt to murder her. Now, that, that to me at first thought made me think, well, he's not all that kind of guy, bad guy that he would do anything like that. What they, that's not what they meant. What they meant was the kind of person that Glenn had been, if you knew him, if he wanted her dead, she'd be dead. Uh, but <clears throat> that, that in itself gives a little uh, wrong impression because he had lived a really rough life. There's no question about that. He even shot a man one time uh, who later became a convert of his, <laughs> interestingly. But uh, uh, he, uh, he got into some, about 20 years prior uh, to that incident uh, involving his wife, uh, he had been, been involved in really, to me, very minor things, but they were charged as felonies. One was the uh, uh, stealing of a homemade, a plywood boat and an outboard motor. And the other one was a second degree burglary charge. Uh, but that became very significant later when he was tried and convicted. But anyway, then <clears throat> 10 years before this incident occurred in 1991, he was saved. Uh, he went to the, this preacher's house. He was about to shoot him because there, his, the preachers, uh, one of, well, two of his daughters were married to Glenn Summerford's sons, and there were some squabble differences, and Glenn went there to straighten things out. And uh, in the course of that, he, he became converted. And then for, for 10 years, he was really, basically straight out, you know, and, and not involved in any kind of, of, of shenanigans. But anyway, uh, I find, found that really interesting <laughs> to begin with, and I wanted to learn more about it. So it uh, continued and uh, got permission to visit Glenn at, uh, at the, the prison outside of Limestone, facility outside of Huntsville and uh, uh, then go to uh, Scottsboro and interview as many people as I could in the church, in the press, uh, the legal people, uh, friends, associates, etc. as I could to try to get a perspective of what really happened. Um, so it, 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 it was, it's quite a ride, <laughs> but, uh, and even so, going to the prison was, of course, interesting. I mean, the first thing they do is show you a, a, a poster with all these implements on it that the prisoners have, uh, imp, uh, innovated, uh, weapons of mass destruction, <laughs> really, you know, but I must say the, 
the, uh, the, the warden was really nice to me, allowing me to have uh, multiple visits with Glenn. And Glenn was very cooperative uh, and uh, willing uh, to talk about anything I want to talk about. The thing, the incident itself, his background, uh, his religious beliefs, et cetera. The only thing that I ever, this is kind of interesting to me, that I uh, ever really confronted him with relative what, to what he told me about the incident with his wife or whatever, uh, was he said he had stopped drinking before that. There was no drinking on his part at that time. Uh, and that the drinking thing becomes a, a really significant factor in the trial and in this film, by the way. They, they pick up on spirits of all kinds. The Holy <laughs> Spirit, the fire, of the Holy Ghost and the, 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 the liquid spirits as well, as well as some other uh, images that they pursue. But the, I found out that uh, although he denied it, his family, his sons told me, yes, he was drinking. But, and uh, one of the critical days of, there were about three critical days in that incident uh, that he had gone with Darlene uh, to visit his son and his wife and some of the other relatives. And, uh, <clears throat> uh, and that was the Friday of the night he was supposed to have put her hand in a serpent box. And they were both drinking, uh, not just Glenn, but Darlene as well. And, and the family had no reason to say, they weren't trying to throw off on, you know, Darlene or, they were saying he was drinking, she was drinking. And then the, the, the daughter took Darlene, the Darlene wanted to go in and use the restroom, so they went inside. And uh, she, so the daughter started talking to her and saying, look, Darlene, you're telling Glenn that you're going with all these men having all this stuff. And I mean, you can't do that, you know, you just can't do that. And she said, well, uh, you know, whatever. So, but, uh, then they go outside and uh, the daughter talks, the daughter-in-law talks to Glenn and said, now Glenn don't do anything stupid. And he says, I'm not going to do anything stupid. Why don't you come over to the house tonight? And we'll talk about all this stuff that's going on. And she, she says she will. Unfortunately, and ironically, she doesn't, whatever reason. And that's the first night that supposedly Glenn puts Darlene's hand in a serpent box. Um, but I, uh, we, uh, you asked me how I got involved with this film, the HBO. Uh, I didn't seek anything along that line at all. I don't know how they learned about it. it um, but anyway, they contacted me. We, uh, the directors, really nice, both of them, uh, Thale Love and Brian uh, uh, Stokely. So, so both really nice guys, I thought. And they wanted to talk about uh, this story. And uh, uh, for the most part, everything that, that came out about the story, besides my book, came from the trial. And that was from what Darlene said at the trial. And it only lasted two days, really, really. Three total even the jury and the conviction, almost no trial, but mostly her statements. And they were interested in this, the whole picture and so forth. And I, and I said, you know, uh, told them about the archival stuff we had, the, the documentaries, the book, et cetera. 
And uh, at first they used my tapes and so forth with the films for uh, research items and that was okay. Then, uh, then uh, they want to film uh, some of us here in the archives and outside in the rain. <laughs> Atmosphere. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and inside. Uh, and then later I have, have a cabin up at the lake, Wautauga. They wanted to have it there in front of the fire and, and in the dark and, <laughs> you know, and uh, uh, so, so I kind of was pulled in to the, <laughs> I don't consider myself an actor at all. And uh, to, to me, it wasn't all fun and games. It was, you know, it, it's hard work, really. You know, you go over and over and over stuff. <laughs> a reluctant star. And uh, well, we're looking forward to seeing the documentary and I would encourage folks to, to seek out your books on, on the subject and uh, they can decide how accurate the film is. Uh, we do have several folks who've been waiting patiently with some questions. So uh, let me kick it over to Jeremy up in Wait, the May I say just one thing before we go? Certainly. Uh, I, I would really like them to read the book too, but a, a film is a different uh, context than the written word. And you really have two different artistic forms. And that means each form has uh, certain things that help them and shade things and interpret things like music, you know, or certain uh, mood setting things like the darkness, the, the, the flames, the fire, the, the, the spirits, all of that creates images that are appropriate to the film. But the film, as they told me to begin with now, we want to use your materials, but it's going to be my film, <laughs> you know? So in general, the film, I think, tries to give both sides of the picture, the, the Glenn side and the Darlene side. But it's a different thing than the reality of interviews. And it's also different, we could go into a lot of different things too, the time involved, but I'll let it go with that. A different interpretation. I think that's an excellent point, Tom. And, and thank you so much for sharing uh, this background material. And Jeremy, uh, I'll turn it over to you for some questions. Sure, yeah, we're getting a, um, a fair number of, of questions sent in. Uh, I know we're, we're, we're bumping up against the time that we said we would stop, but I'll, I'll kind of, we'll keep going, of course, to the attendees if you, you know, if, if you have to leave. Uh, I will be, we are recording this and we will post the entire thing within the next couple of days to the Archives of Appalachia's uh, YouTube account. Uh, if you do have to leave for any reason and you want to see the Q&A later, that'll be available. Or you can share that with anyone you know who wasn't able to join in. Uh, but Dr. Burton, we've got uh, a number of questions here. Um, one that, that may be, uh, uh, that you may be able to respond to here. Someone has asked, is this, is, is serpent handling specifically uh, primarily an Appalachian practice or does it occur elsewhere? It does occur elsewhere. Uh, not very long ago, I came across um, kind of serendipitously that a woman had uh, been bitten in a religious service in California, uh, in or maybe Orange County. And uh, that was in 1954, I believe. So, and that was not, uh, as I mentioned, the, the main serpent handling groups here are oneness or Trinity people. This, this woman was a part of this, of a group called the Church of the Firstborn. So and that curiously was the same name as another group that I that I came in contact with in Middlesbrough, but I don't think they were really related. But uh, as the early in the history, 
uh, <clears throat> when these servant handlers went out preaching and, and holding revivals and uh, evangelizing, uh, they used the serpent handling as a means of confirming the word. And so it went uh, mainly uh, in the, the southern uh, areas, but I, I, I went to a church, for example, in Indiana, but a lot of those churches were uh, formed, that one by the sailors who were from Kentucky. So that's what happened a lot of times as these people moved out of Appalachia, of course, they took their religion with them and it went into uh, Texas and uh, places in the West as well as uh, North as well too. Yeah. So that, that historical perspective you just gave, that touches on another question we got. Uh, someone is asking, if a historian wanted to work on serpent handling in its early years, are there archives you could recommend that have those historical resources, or would something like church newspapers be the only real source on the topic? Well, yes. Uh, uh, I, I used an archives there in Cleveland, uh, and uh, I've forgotten now. It, uh, exactly. It's in Cleveland. I'm sorry. It, it, I think it's associated. That's been so long, you know. Uh, I think maybe it was uh, involved uh, with, with the church that's there. But I'm sorry. I, I could help somebody individually. But that. But there, I could use the evangel and go through all those all those papers. Uh, uh, Ralph Hood at the University of uh, Ch uh, Tennessee at Chattanooga. They have a, now a very fine archives of, of not, not the old materials, I don't think, but they have uh, a, a really fine video uh, library of uh, multiple uh, serpent handling services. And uh, they, they have been uh, active, uh, Ralph uh, Hood and um, oh, uh, Paul Williams' son, uh, those two individuals. That, that's another fine archives. Great. And a couple of our attendees just chimed in to help and have pointed out you're probably referring to the Dixon Pentecostal Research Center at Lee University. Yes, that's thank you. Did one of the <laughs> listeners say that? That's right. It looks like we've got some experts pointing in. Right. That was the place I just couldn't remember. Uh, so we have another question about uh, the the signs following uh, uh, services and the actual content of those services and the rituals that are a part of them. And the question is, how do the other signs that you mentioned, the uh, uh, drinking deadly poisons and speaking in tongues, how do the other signs, signs other than serpent handling, factor into these religious rituals? Well, uh, first of all, that none of the signs are always done by a congregation who follow the signs. And they're not always done by the individuals who do follow them. Uh, they feel that they must, they should be anointed by the spirit in order and then directed which signs they should uh, perform or involved with. Um, and um, they, well, for example, um, the, uh, the, when we first went, when Jack Schrader and his uh, film crew that we had from the, uh, the university and went to a congregation in uh, Sneedville, uh, I mean, Newport. Um, uh, at that service, uh, the, the preacher, the, he was assistant preacher, uh, drank uh, carbon tetrachloride, uh, a poison. And at other services, uh, Generally, they use a, a, a strychnine powder that's mixed with water. They will drink 
and sift through uh, the jars of strychnine. So uh, that's that's one of the signs. Uh, they if they drink any deadly thing, it shall not hurt them. They they do believe in casting out demons, and on the film, even Marty, who is a son of Glenn Summerford, uh, he talks about a service in which a, a demon uh, is cast out. Um, the glossolalia, or the speaking in tongues, is very common, and often they will have someone who will interpret tongues. Now that comes from uh, a, a verse really uh, in uh, the 12th chapter of Corinthians, I believe, Paul talking about the nine spiritual signs. Uh, and, uh, uh, and one of them is speaking in tongues and the other, another one is interpreting tongues. So they do, and they do have uh, tongues, and that might just be uh, while they're going up together uh, to pray. One might uh, be filled with the Holy Ghost and speak in tongues, and then at the end of service, they might call everyone up for laying out of hands for someone. Or <clears throat> often that they'll use cloths that they will uh, call prayer cloths that they'll dip in and olive oil generally, and send out from the church that they can take to persons who are ill that will complement uh, the healing and the laying on of hands. So uh, they, 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 uh, they do, uh, as the spirit directs them, uh, and sometimes, they say, well, I do it on faith, but for the most part, they do it anointed by the Spirit, but they do do all the five signs. So we had uh, one question that I'll just uh, quickly respond to, and that was a, a reminder about the film and where and when it premieres and how it's going to be available. The film we're referring to is called Alabama Snake. And it's going to uh, premiere next Wednesday, December the 9th on HBO. And it will be available for streaming on all of the HBO outlets shortly after that. Uh, I don't know their distribution plan beyond that. So initially it is going to be restricted to HBO, but you should be able to see that beginning next Wednesday. Um, we have a question uh, from one of your former students. You know, we've been referring to your Appalachian and, and folklore research, but there's a, uh, this student remembers you as a Shakespearean scholar and teacher yeah. as well. This is Catherine Edwards. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> and so uh, the question is actually about that, um, about, uh, you know, your interest in Shakespeare and your interest in Appalachian uh, culture and, and folklore. Um, in, in many of your writings, she's, she's saying you often refer to Shakespeare through very specific works, very specific lines. Can you discuss, as a folklore scholar, how you reconcile Shakespearean references with regional folklore? <laughs> well, uh, I don't know exactly, except I'm reminded uh, that in a way, like this, this situation is like a Shakespearean drama, uh, uh, with uh, we have murder and uh, or attempted murder and suicide, they have infidelity and jealousy, uh, and uh, betrayal and revenge and all those themes that are in the Shakespearean plays. Those tragedies, particularly, uh, are, are right there in this one little uh, situation. And I keep thinking, and I, this is important to me, that statement that Hamlet makes to Rosencrantz and Guildenstern and Hamlet, uh, what an unworthy thing you make of me. You would pluck out the heart of my mystery. And that is uh, key 
phrase to me and anybody who's interested in Appalachian studies, Appalachian people, uh, sign followers, women <laughs> who are off the beaten path, such as in my, this last book. And that is to, to put them in a pot or some stereotypical framework, you know, uh, or this happens, this person happens to be from a poor uh, poverty stripping situation and then see that as Appalachia, you're, you're missing the whole point, really. You know, you're, how unworthy a thing you're making of Appalachia and how unworthy a thing you are making of that particular individual if you don't know anything about the circumstances that has brought that situation about or how they're dealing with it or, or the human uh, conflict uh, that's involved in that particular person's life. And that's, that's you know, certainly about Serpent hunting. For the most part, we I gave some some help to a, a film. It was for a national a broadcast uh, company, and it's they used it. Uh, the first scene, as I remember, I don't even remember the name of the title of the film right now, but uh, it started out as said. Here we are in an area that in most people's mind is dealing with poverty, <laughs> you know. And then we go from that to the church with sign followers. And the stereotypical image is that all sign followers are poor uh, people living in poverty, stricken areas and circumstances, which just isn't true. Uh, one, one of uh, the pastors, for example, I just talked to in the last week over Mars Hill and his brother and his sister-in-law were both killed uh, through serpent animal. They died from serpent blood. But he, he's an intellectual person, he has uh, a middle class life or middle class uh, home. He has a good uh, uh, job in a, a large uh, merchandise uh, place in Newport. He has multiple children who have received uh, degrees from ETSU. So uh, it's it's so easy to pluck, try to, you know, think you can pluck out the heart of the mystery of Appalachia or Appalachians uh, easily. Uh, uh, it's, it's too complicated uh, for that kind of approach. Yeah. Well, thank you so much. You know, I, I'm, um, I've heard it said that the, the plural of anecdote is not data. And, you know, the, the danger of treating, a, it's also true that a single anecdote can never stand in for an entire people. And I really think some of the, the beauty and the value and so much of the research that you've done is that you've gone out of your way to, uh, to respect and to, to, to highlight the dignity of the people and the customs that you are documenting uh, and that you're writing about and that you're researching. Uh, and I think that comes through in all of your work. Um, so I wanna thank you, Dr. Burton. Thank you, Dr. Roach for your contributions tonight. Uh, I'll apologize to those uh, who we did not get to. Uh, the, the answer, the, the questions are still rolling in, um, but I'll encourage you to, to, to watch the film if you're able in a week uh, and see a part of one of the stories that Dr. Burton has, has, has documented during his time. Uh, and uh, on behalf of the 38 attendees we ended up having here tonight. Uh, thank you to Dr. Burton. Thank you to Dr. Roach for tonight. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye.